Jason Thomas came here and preached one time. He was the one that talked with all the ten dollar words uh, for an extended period of time. And uh, probably most of you had to go back and watch that about three times to pick up on all of what he was saying. Because he's smart beyond his own capability. Uh, but I get to, I get the privilege of, of, of talking with him every day. And, and every time I talk to Jason, I learn something. That guy, has he just finished his Master's of Divinity. It was about 81 hours at the graduate level. So you guys who have been to college, you understand. He did that while he had a full-time job as a PA working for the VA. And he serves in the Guard as well. So he's just a super guy. But that discipleship program, the things that I realized this week, and I would say this to you Sunday school teachers, even though you're studying, is that better? Okay. Even though you're studying your lesson for Sunday school, let me encourage you to do something because this is an easy trap to fall into. I've fallen into it since I've been here. You got to study for you. You got you got to let God pour into you while you're building that class or that presentation that you're doing for your for your class. Because just studying the lesson in and of itself may not minister to you like you need for your own personal life. And and that was something that Jason told me this week. That's never dawned on me. I mean, in all the years that I've been involved in, in, in doing Sunday school and other things. Uh, but I can tell you that in, in dropping in a couple of classes this morning and listening to what they had to say in the lesson, I think somebody's been digging in my notes. Because uh, today I want to talk to you about having a heart for the harvest. And it's, a, it's, a, it's four little verses that we've read many, many, many times. When we did the pastor swap in central Louisiana, the... Uh, Every pastor, wherever they went, they preached on this. And it was interesting to me the difference in everyone's take on these four verses. So I took it myself and developed it. And uh, there's some powerful things in here. So I want to give you some things this morning, and I'll go through. There, there I have five steps. You know, every pa pastor's got to have steps to something, right? So we'll give you notes on, on all kinds of things. But I took notes when I was sitting in your seat, so I'll give you some things this morning. But here's what I want you to think about. We're called to be fishers of men. So most of the guys who've been to retreats have their little bracelet. Now, this is an interesting conversation piece with a lot of folks because in the Catholic community, this is an axe bracelet. I made sure mine didn't have axe anywhere else. Uh, but to a white perch, white perch fisherman, you wasted a bunch of swivels. And so I've had them ask me, are you a white perch fisherman? Why, well, yes, I am. I haven't done it two years now because of, of, of this ministry thing, but... Uh, but yeah, I claim to be one. I have a boat for it. Uh, but I just haven't pulled it out to go. But let me tell you what God's called me to do. And that's where these little trinkets like this lead you to a conversation to be able to share the gospel with people. But we're all called to, to be fishers of men. But I'm going to tell you what I'm afraid has happened in our churches. And I've been guilty of this before too. We become keepers of aquariums and not fishers of men. Because we become very comfortable where we are. And, and, and I would tell you, as we go through this this morning and we talk about this, it, it's, you're going to understand, you're going to see, because I didn't realize it either. It's a very slippery, easy slope to fall down because it's very subtle and gradual. That we get comfortable in our own area of life and we don't pay attention to what's going on around us. Yeah, we're cordial to folks, and I'm not saying we're rude, but I'm, not, I'm telling you that how many times have we seen masses and not individuals? And so this morning, that's what I want to talk about. 
The other thing I was I have in my notes here as well is, you know, even Jesus went to church. And we have folks these days that will tell you, well, I don't have to go to church. I can sit on a deer stand and worship the Lord. You certainly can. But we're a community of believers. And we're told in God's word, don't forsake yourself the assembly because iron sharpens iron. And there's a lot of things that happens in this corporate worship that benefits everybody in here. We're a body. A body can't be a single piece. It's made up of different parts. And enough, those are all not connected. A body doesn't function. It's a dead, a dead thing. So uh, I would tell you that even Jesus himself went to church. In fact, he loved the church enough that he gave himself up for it. So he was pretty fond of it. Also, Jesus was the greatest preacher that ever lived. Now, I would tell you from a, from a student's standpoint, he had an unfair advantage because he was talking about himself. So when he's reading this, he's reading an autobiography or biography. Uh, he's not he's not having to do what I'm having to do, which is take this and, and, and understand it and allow the Holy Spirit to develop it for me. But something that I've noticed and I was reading in a couple of weeks here that church growth experts tell us that we should be preaching on topics of interest for congregations and getting away from some of the hard things that are in the Bible. Well, if you guys, I don't know if you know who Bill Stafford is. If you've seen the movie Fireproof, He's the grumpy old man that's in that movie, the, the, the mean old neighbor. Well, he's friends with Philip, so he's been to our church several times. And this is what Bill Stafford said. He said, we have too many preacherettes that are preaching sermonettes that got off the internet to Christianettes who are living in their kitchenettes, smoking their cigarettes, and driving their Corvettes. <laughs> he's, he's a pretty humorous guy. But there's some truth to that, folks. There's a lot of people... You go on the internet and you do a search right quick and you pick a topic and you just watch and see if there's a sermon on that. And very rarely will you hear anything referring to sin or judgment or anything like that. And I, I would tell you that one of the biggest preachers in Houston, Texas is that very way. He loves to tell people that we have a God of love. We do. He loves to tell people that God's going to provide everything you need. He will. But it's according to his purpose and not necessarily what you want. Everybody is not driving a Lexus or, or, or some expensive vehicle and it's got a bank account that's blowing up because that's not necessarily what we need. What we need is Christ indwelled in us through the Holy Spirit that's teaching us how to live a life that glorifies him. At the same time, build a kingdom that he cared enough about that he gave his life for it. But that's not necessarily what we're always hearing. So, you know, if, if it was important enough to Jesus for him to step out of holy and perfect heaven to be born in a barn, laid in a trough, wrapped in swaddling clothes, which, by the way, were death clothes, to be, and subject himself to a human punishment by some Roman thugs, then how important do you think the church is to him? Amen. And by the way, it's not a building. Amen. It's us. It's the people who, who God has, uh, has indwelled with the Holy Spirit. So here's a, the simple point to this. Spreading the seeds and, the har and, and reaping the harvest is what God's called us to do. We are to spread the seeds. I did a deep study of the book of Mark. I had to write a paper for it. And it was only four verses, honestly. But there's a parable in there about the seeds. And most people have not read this. It's right before the mustard seed parable. And, and, and so when you, when you read it, there's not a lot of commentary on it. Praise God, I was able to get 14 pages out of that four verses. And I don't know how I did it. But anyway, I... I but the thing all through that, the whole thing that Jesus was talking about in that parable was this. It's our job to spread the seeds. We don't water them. We don't fertilize them. We don't even have a chance to, to, to have any effect on the growth. But we are told to spread those seeds. God, that seed is God's word. And it, and it, it is a living word. So everyone in here, as you read it, it will speak differently to you. That doesn't mean that the, that the overall portion of it changes, the theological piece of it. But God's word is a living word. It speaks to all of us in, in certain ways. That's what I was listening to this morning in the Sunday school class, which was phenomenal, by the way. I mean, you did an amazing job of digging into that. I, I don't, bless your heart. Because when you start talking about the white, great white throne judgment versus the, the judgment seat of Christ, you can tie your mind in knots. Some of the greatest theologians can't explain that because it's hard. But that's the beauty of what we get to read and what we get to share in. So let me read this morning. I want to start out in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And then that's where I would kind of to dive into today. And there'll be some other verses that I'll pull out of that as well. But but I'll read this to you. And, and, and I think I think my version is ESV that I, that I actually have in my notes. But it, it goes on. It says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction, 
When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest, into his harvest. So let's break that down this morning and talk about a couple of things. So step one of what this is, we got to go. We must go. Jesus went. Folks, I know this is not popular and a lot of people don't like this, but the idea that you think that people are going to pile in here because we're having church is not. Look around. We got vacant seats. I don't know how many people live in Franklin Parish. 15, 20,000. Of that, probably 80% of them are unchurched. That's how it is in Rapage Parish. We have 100,000 people in Rapage Parish. 80,000 of them are unchurched. None of the churches down there are busting at the seams. The idea anymore that we open the doors and everybody pours in, it, it doesn't work that way. Jesus didn't do it that way. He went. He wore out a bunch of sandals going and doing different things. And he went on foot. He didn't have the luxury that we had. This morning, Michelle and I got in the vehicle. This morning, we drove 100 miles in, le in less than two hours. By the way, I wasn't speeding. But the point is that we have the ability now in modern technology to get on an airplane and be in a foreign country in, in two or three hours. We can be in Central America in no time at all. You know, we have the ability to get in a vehicle and be in Monroe in just a few minutes. So we don't have an excuse not to go. But I would tell you that most of the people that probably need to hear what we're talking about right now are in walking distance of here. Not necessarily driving distance. I've said this before, and I got accused of being, not here, but at my old church, as we refer to it. Uh, <laughs> I got accused of, of being anti-mission trip. I'm not. I'm all for it. I've been to 31 countries, so I, I'm not afraid to go overseas. But guys, God lays it out in order in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. If you break that down to what the context of that means, Judea is here, your local area. Samaria would be your state in the United States. And then the uttermost part speaks for itself. That, that's your trips overseas. And all of those are important. When, we, when you guys go to Nebraska, that's very important. Those people up there need to hear God's word. But when we've got teams in Nebraska, we need to have a team here. When we've got teams in, in pick a country, there's 180 of them. When we've got folks over there, we need to have folks here. We, it's not one or the other. It's one and the other. And, and, and But we, we miss that sometimes. Uh, you know, our gospel is to go and give it, not come and get it. Jesus didn't wait on people to come to him. You guys have all seen the four seasons of The Chosen, I hope. If you haven't, you need to go watch them. Jesus didn't sit still for anything. He was constantly looking at the disciples going, hey, pack your stuff, we're headed out. Or he sent them out two by two to different places. But nothing's changed except we have technology now to travel. Everything else is the same. He still expects us to go and do what we're called to do. Matthew 28, it's very, very clear. If I can see it, I'll read it to you. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What was the first word in there? Go. It didn't say sit or wait. And so we got to go. And I'm not trying to get everybody in here to go buy plane tickets and fly overseas, but I'm telling you, every day you bump into someone who needs Christ. Amen. Every day. You know, uh, it's tough sometimes to, to recognize that because we're in a busy world and I got that. But Romans 10, 14 is pretty clear. It says, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Yep. Well, when I used to sit where you're at, I think, well, preacher, preach it. Well, guess what? Acts 1 8 tells you that everyone in here who's born again is a preacher. Not a pastor, not an evangelist. Those are called positions, but a, but a preacher. If you know the truth of God's word and the Holy Spirit has indwelled you, you are a preacher. You can share your testimony of what God did in your life. And I've had people argue that with me. There's no argument to it. I didn't make that up. I mean, it, it's written in God's word. You can go study it. The second thing we got to do is we got to see. Jesus saw in verse 36, he saw. And he didn't see crowds. He saw faces. And how many times have we looked at, at, at a group of folks and we just see a crowd, a mass of folks? I, I, I shared this with, with Jamie A. When I was in Iraq in 2010, I had uh, I started out with, with about 1,100 guys and it swelled up to about 10,000 at one point. But I can tell you that every day and some nights, we got missions to, that we were supposed to go execute. Now, here's the thing. There's a hierarchy there just like there is everywhere else. So I answered to some general officer somewhere who said, hey, this is what we need to do in order to affect the entire theater. 
I want to be honest with you guys. I didn't have a chance to look at faces because I couldn't do that. Because when you start looking at faces, you start wondering, is he the one that's not coming home? Because as I read intelligence reports and got prepared to execute this mission, and I gave my, my staff specific instructions on how we're going to plan it, I can tell you right off the bat, somebody was probably going to get hurt. Because there was a lot of things going on there that was not conducive to, to, to you coming home you know, safely. And, and But keeping my eyes on what we had to do, I couldn't look at individuals. Does that mean I didn't care about them? Not one bit. But we're not faced with that right here. In fact, it's the opposite. We're at war, all right. But we're at war against a, a spiritual enemy that's here to devour and kill families and individuals and everyone else. I mean, the Bible calls him a roaring lion. You know, I, I remember watching Wild Kingdom when I was a kid. And, and, and poor old Jim got the one, he's the one that always had to wrestle the, the bear or whatever. And <laughs> I, I think that's why that show went off, because Jim got tired of fighting all the animals. But when you watch lions, they were very, very specific in how their, their tactics were. They would look for the weakest animal. They would isolate that animal, and they would devour that animal. There's no, there's not a happenstance why God's word calls him a roaring lion, because that's exactly what they do. Think about how many folks that we've seen that have, have gone through depression or something, and they've gotten isolated. They pulled out of church. They quit going the very place they need to be, so we can all love on them and pour into them. But they get, they, they, they get isolated. Next thing you know, they, they get in deep depression, and all these other things start happening. And that's exactly how the enemy wants to do it. And that's what he tries to do to your families. He's going to come in and try to destroy your families. Jesus stayed focused on his mission, but he looked at individual people, and he had compassion on them, and he always, always, always took time to minister to them. Think about the scene in The Chosen when that lady comes up and forces her way through that crowd and grabs that tassel on the bottom of his garment. He stopped what he was doing. Now, he was going to heal or actually raise back to life uh, Jairus' daughter who was dead. But he stopped what he was doing and he turned. This is one of those powerful scenes in that whole thing. Yeah, I, I used to watch that before we go to retreats. I call that my Rocky movie because that scene to me showed absolutely who Jesus was. He turned to her and that girl had not been, had anybody had never put their hands on her in 12 years. Her family cast her out because of her blood issue because she was unclean according to the law. And so he turned to her and of course he asked, who touched me? Obviously he knew. But it was a lesson he was teaching to the people that were there. Her faith healed her. Amen. Not the tassel on the bottom of his garment or anything else. It was her faith. But she wanted so badly to touch that because she believed that that would change her life. But he paused what he was doing. That's my point. And he spent time with her. And if you remember in the show, he called her daughter. Mm -hmm. Now, she was an orphan. She had been completely rejected by her family. But he called her daughter. Well, that's how we are when we're adopted into the family of God. We're not orphans anymore. Amen. We are now part of the family. And we're now a son and a daughter of, of, of Christ. And, and I thought that that's just one of the most beautiful scenes to me. But some of the people he came across, he healed them. Some of them he cast out demons. But others he just spoke, simply spoke truth into their lives. Why did he heal certain people or raise certain people from the dead and others he didn't? I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure a lot of his disciples, you know, as you see it portrayed out in the chosen, they wondered the same thing. But God has a bigger plan that he has, that he's working through. The, the thing he's given us and the only thing we need to worry about is our portion of that plan because it all fits into the plan. Back to my analogy in Iraq, my little piece of that pie was I had, could not fail because if that point failed, it caused the rest of the plan to have to change. We're not going to change God's plan by us not doing what we're supposed to, but we are going to answer for it. I believe with all my heart, folks, that even a saved person, God's going to look at you and go, what did you do with what I gave you? And we've been given a lot to. If you think about this, this, this country we live in, there's no poor people in America. On, on average, even with what we call the poverty level, you compare that to another country. We're not poor here. No, no one here starves. We've got so many social net programs that, that take care of everything. And, and so we, we ourselves have got to look past all that and look at the spiritual aspects of this. I've got a sister right now. I haven't spoken to her in a while. She's uh, said some things, did some things with my mom that wasn't exactly up on, on par. Her husband is dying of cancer. And, and, and my other sister called me the other day when she and I were on the way home. And she said, hey, you need to be praying for David. And I said to her, I said, hey, what you need to be praying for David is that God will save you. Don't worry about his cancer. Because 
he, he, this, is, this is what he said. He goes, you know, I, I've never really done anything with religion. And I thought to myself, well, first of all, the definition of a religion is God's, or man's attempt to get to God. I don't want anything to do with that. Amen. Folks, this ain't religion right here. Amen. Jesus came to us. Amen. It's not religion. It's, it's, it's salvation and it's a relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of folks miss that. I've heard that some of my other denominational brothers say, well, you know, in your religion, I don't have a religion. I'm not part of a religion. Amen. I'm part of a movement. Mm -hmm. God came here and he's moving us to do what he instructed us to do. How many people have we passed by because we didn't see a life hurting or a need? And I'm as guilty as anybody because I, I get busy doing my thing and I don't look at people in their faces. You can see hurt on people's faces. Every morning I sit and eat breakfast with Manny Belgard, who was dead right before we went to our retreat and God allowed him to be revived and he came. On Friday, dead on Friday and at a meeting for a preparation for a retreat on Monday. We call him Lazarus now. <laughs> But every morning when I eat breakfast with him, Manny's looking at people's faces. And if, and if he sees somebody, we eat breakfast at this little store thing. If he sees somebody, he will go to the cash register and say, hey, can I pray with you? I've seen him do it a thousand times. And it dawned on me, though, that why, why would I do that? Am I scared to do that? Am I afraid that they'll tell me no? I've never seen anybody tell Manny no. And they don't all know him. A lot of them do, but I mean, because that, that reputation of what I just told you. But guys, that goes anywhere you're at. You know, at, at work, uh, you know, when I was in, that was a tough thing. But I, I tell you what, I wish I had another shot at it now because I'd go about it differently. I think my soldiers would see me pray with them as opposed to being that hard-faced, always, you know, kind of keeping that separation. That, that, that has to happen to a certain extent, but there also has to be a compassionate side to that. We, we can never get too busy to where we don't see people where they are because there's a lot of hurting people out there that won't tell you that. And, and, and look, and we see it in some of the things that, that the way they react to driving aggressively, that the, the way they act in the store, you know, some of the language some people use is, if you peel that onion back, underneath that's a broken heart and a life that's shattered, and they need, they need to know something that can heal them. And then we have that. If I was standing here with a cure to cancer, and I didn't give it to anybody, how sorry would that be? Well, we got cured to, to an eternal destination that people don't want to go to. No one talks about hell anymore. What was that stat that you gave us, Debbie, this morning? Where you at? What was that stat this morning? You said, what, 20 years ago? 20 years ago. That 90% years ago. of the pastors didn't believe in a literal hell? Mm -hmm. I don't know how you stand up here and talk about Jesus if you don't believe in a literal hell. True. Why would he come and do what he did if there wasn't a hell? Mm -hmm. We'd all be in a safe boat. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't need that. We'd just cruise right on through life and whatever, you know, everybody's good, right? Mm -hmm. That's not true. <laughs> There's a whole lot in this book that talks about hell. A whole lot in this book. It's real. Because if it wasn't real, what would be the point of Satan doing what he does? I mean, I can tell you, you can go back and read it. A third of the angels got cast out of heaven for a reason. And they know what that looks like. They were there. They saw it. And still pride kicked them out. That's a scary thing. We haven't seen that yet. We get a glimpse of it every now and then. We think we do. But we haven't seen that yet. But we're trusting what Jesus gave us was real. And I believe it's real. I believe heaven's real, and I believe heaven's real, or hell's real. And, and, and I'm going to tell you something, too. The Bible says at the point that you draw your last breath, whatever choice you made when he presented that option to you is where you're going to end up. This idea of going somewhere and somebody praying you out of it, guys, I can't find that anywhere in here. Anywhere in here. It's a split-second decision. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Or the other. Luke 10, 30, verses uh, 30 through 37. I want to go into the great, the Good Samaritan now and talk a little bit about that because this will show you kind of the attitude that, that, that a lot of us have. And this happened way back when. It says, Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and, de and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back through. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? 
He said, one showed him mercy, and Jesus said to him, he answered, the one who showed him mercy, he said, you go and do likewise. Guys, that's a command, by the way. Anytime you see it like that, that is a commandment. And it wasn't just to them. He told this story for us as well. So let me break this portion down right here and talk a little bit about this. That certain priest that came down the road and passed on the other side, that was a preacher. So somebody's pastor saw a man in need, and well, I'm too busy. I got to go down there. I got to get something. Maybe we're having coffee with all the Southern Baptist guys or something this morning. You know, we're meeting at the cafe. Or, you know, I'm going to the deacon's meeting or whatever. And he, he passed that by. How many times do we pass by, again, those needs that we see because we've got something else to do? How many times have we looked the other way because we didn't want to deal with that beggar that's standing on the corner? Now, I've never been good with that. I had a buddy that was here in the first service when I came, and, and Chuck is really good at that. He will stop what he's doing. He pulled off in the median of the interstate the other day to share Jesus with a guy that was there with one leg that was asking for money. And, and instead of giving him money, Chuck buys him meals and gives him something to eat, but he's going to share Jesus with him when he's doing it. I don't take time out of my schedule to do that. I've never parked in the median of the interstate and shared anything with anybody. But that's what he does. The Levite that did not see him on the, and went on the other side of the road, that was a church member. So I, when, when, I, when I was thinking through this, I'm thinking, okay, so if the preacher ain't doing it, he's probably not training the church people to do it, or maybe they made a conscious decision not to do it. But either way, neither one of those folks did anything for this guy. They went on the other side of the road so they could pretend like they didn't see him, right? He's still laying there. He saw him, apparently. But the good Samaritan saw him. So let me ask you this today. If you're saved, some good Samaritan shared Jesus with you. So what would you think if, if you get to that point one day, or if, if this, let's just say they never shared with you, and you get there and, and Jesus asks you, well, why should I allow you into my heaven? Well, God did this, and I did this, and I gave to the poor and all this kind Yeah, but I never knew you. But, but yeah, Jesus, but, but I did all these things. And then you start thinking back to all those people that you knew that went to church that never stopped to share anything with you. Well, I got news for you. Those of us who do that, we're going to answer that too. How many, hey, Mark, how many opportunities did I give you to share what I, what I poured into your heart and you blew it off? Because you were too busy doing something that really didn't amount to anything. I mean, let's be honest. Get to a restaurant or, or, or a few minutes late for something, it's not going to end the world. But for that one individual, that could mean death or hell. Or excuse me, uh, a lot, death or life for them. Because we don't take the time to share it with them. So step three, Jesus was moved. When we think about being moved, now we don't use this term a lot, but the way that breaks down in the, in the Hebrew, he was moved in his gut. So think about that deep down inside of you. When you have something that just bothers you a lot, it moves you in that direction. That's, that's how Jesus was moved. Folks, we live in a broken world. And Satan is steadily destroying families and he's steadily destroying people and individuals. And, and we're not moved sometimes to, to try to intervene with that when we know what the truth and the antidote to that is. But Jesus was moved. And I thought about that this week. You know, when is the last time I was moved like that? I don't even know. I'm, not, I'm just being point like honest with you. I don't know when the last time I was moved like that. Like God forgive us when we pass by. Jamie likes to share this story about the four, uh, the four friends of the paralytic. They were moved. Because when they couldn't get in the door, they went up and started tearing off the roof. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have been in a Middle, Middle Eastern home, but they, they tend to do a lot of things on the rooftops. I've been shot at from the rooftops and all kinds of stuff. They like to spend time up there. But to tear a roof off, to get a, a friend down to Jesus, that, that, that right there, folks, is being moved. And the, can you imagine the joy that Jesus saw when he looked up and saw that? Because he's like, hey, here's four people that get it. They have that faith. They have that urgency to get somebody. So Because they know I'm going to heal him. And they, and, and they trust me enough that they're willing to go the extra mile to do that. I ripped the roof off lately, Jamie. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, maybe we ought to start tearing off some roofs. So my question to you in reference to that is, are you desperate enough to do whatever it takes to get somebody to Jesus? Or are you just satisfied with, well, hey, I told them about it. Whatever they do with it is what they do with it. I told you guys this last Sunday. I didn't say this as idle words. I mean this with all my heart. If you're going to go to hell while I'm here serving in this capacity, you're going to have to crawl over me to get there. 
I promise you I will grab you by the leg, the arm, or whatever it is. I will tackle you to keep you from going over the edge because you are not going to do that on my watch. And that's not to say that arrogantly, but you're going to hear the truth. And I'm going to read it to you right out of here. And what you do with that now is your choice, but you're going to have to make that choice. You're going to have to declare, no, I want to go to hell because nobody in their right mind wants to go to hell. If you took a survey in this room, I guarantee you, unless somebody's asleep, 100% of the people in here would say, I don't want to go to hell. The problem comes in where salvation starts is, okay, I don't want to go to hell, but I ain't sure I want to let Jesus be Lord of everything. That's the point that separates the men from the boys, so to speak. And that's what, that's what kept me walking in a, in a fake salvation experience for all them years. I didn't want to give up lordship because I kind of like being in charge. But when I look around at what I had done with, with what I was responsible for, I messed it up back. That's what I tell some folks. They're like, well, you know, Mark, uh, I, you know, I, I'm just going to rely on me and I'm going to look for this higher power, I think is what AA tells you, right? And uh, I, I laughed to myself. I'm like, okay, that might work for you, but I'm the one that got me into this and I know what I'm capable of and I know what probably is going to happen if I stay on, on the throne of my life and it ain't working. I can tell you it's a whole lot better with Jesus. Does that mean, again, that he's going to give you everything you want? No. He's not some genie in a bottle that you rub every time you want to make a wish. What he is, he's the king of kings and the lord of lords that can deliver you from all of the problems that you have if you trust in him. Does that mean it's going to be all care bears and unicorns? No. Life is hard. But it's hard because we live in a fallen world. Jesus is the only answer, folks, and we got that. Those of us that are saved, and we got to share that. When we're moved like those four friends are moved, we're going to bring somebody to Jesus and we're going to see the kingdom impacted for Christ and we're going to see our community changed. We, we talk about all the things that are going on, the crime rate and stuff. I sat with the mayor of Alexandria a couple of months ago and I said, hey, Mayor Roy, you want to see this, this city change? He said, yeah, you got a plan? I said, I sure do. Let's go house to house. Because when you start seeing dads return back to the homes and becoming the, the spiritual leader of their homes, FCA put out a, a stat a couple of, of a weeks ago. 93% of families where the husband is saved, the kids and the wife are going to follow. Now, wrap your mind around this. 17% of the homes where only the wife attends church and she's saved, will the kids be saved? When the kids are the only ones that are going to church, 3.5%. You see how that drastically falls off? Dad, it's been charged to us. Don't look at your wife and say, hey, I need you to lead out in this. No. We've been appointed in that position. We need to assume the role and do what we're supposed to be doing. Part of that role is teaching our families not only how to live according to God's word, but to share the things that God's given us to share. That's with your wife, with your kids, with all of the folks around you. We get so comfortable that we're not moved when somebody's in need. God forgive us for that as well. As church members, we've got to be very careful that we're not setting up some type of barriers. Because I can tell you that the, uh, I've been in churches before. Michelle and I got to visit a lot of churches in the Army. And, and there are those out there that profess one thing. And, and what you watch is not what's, what, what's being professed. It's hypocrisy. Just plain and simple. And people can smell a faith. If my buddy Jesse was here, he'd tell you right out. He never wanted to go to church with all them Sundays. that, that they, uh, He said, man, I drank with them guys for five days out of the week. Why in the world want to go sit with them on Sunday morning? I mean... And that's just one example. There's a lot of other things. Step number four is we got to care. We must have that compassion that Jesus talked about in verse 36. When a Samaritan saw the beaten man, he had compassion and he was willing to be inconvenienced. Now, I want you to think about this. He paid for his lodging for two days. Folks, I, I did a little research on denarii. That was about a, a day's worth of pay. So if you break that down, and let's just say $10 is your minimum wage, that then you know that's, that's about $74.50 that he paid for one, and he paid it twice. So hotel rooms weren't cheap then either, by the way. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Is there about $150 or $40 for a, for a hotel room even back then? But he was willing to pay that, and he didn't even know the guy. But he extended that opportunity to that guy. And then he said, hey, whatever other bills he racks up while I'm gone, I'll come back by and settle that up with you as well. So th this morning, you know, if we're going to be like Jesus, it's going to cost us some convenience. It's probably going to cost us some money. But I can guarantee you it's going to cost you some time. Because the things that you think are important, I bet you if you were to ask, if you could have a personal conversation with Jesus, which you can, by the way, ask him, hey, God, is my schedule filled with worthless junk? 
Or is there something meaningful in there for the kingdom? And he'll answer that for you. Just be careful when you ask it. You better be prepared for the answer. I think you guys have heard me say this before. Adrian Rogers is quoted as saying that if you show me your checkbook, I'll show you where your heart is. Now, for you younger kids, y'all don't know what a checkbook is. But I, a debit card will work. I can show you off your debit card receipts. Because, guys, our, our, where we put our money, where we put our, our faith a lot of times. And I know they don't like preachers talking about money, but I used to get, didn't like about it either. I, I used to wouldn't like to hear about it either, but it's true. And here's something for us to remember that I thought was kind of interesting. When fishermen don't fish, they fight. So think about this from a church perspective. It's very easy to go from an outward focus to an inward focus. And when that happens, you start having fratricide within the church. Now, a lot of people don't know what that is. So the Hollywood's giving it this term, friendly fire. Well, let me just tell you something. When your buddies are shooting at you, it ain't friendly. Bullets don't discriminate. We got to keep the outward focus. We got to make sure we're shored up in here so that when we're focused out there, that everything that we're doing is for the kingdom again. But that starts individually with us. I've heard people pray, God, I want to have revival during this revival session, but don't start with me. Start with John or Joe or whoever. Oh, they need it bad. Really? <laughs> what does that sound like? I, and I also heard of uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fred Gilbert say, hey, what we ought to be doing is we ought to draw a circle. And stand in it and go, God, revive everything in this circle. Because when we have revival meetings, that's what a lot of them are, are meetings. We, ta we tag them as that. But does anybody leave here changed from how they came? Because that's what a revival is. Where God takes you, uh, by the way, it only happens for born-again believers. Lost people can't have revival. you got to get saved before you can be revived. But we come in and we, when we do that and we think, okay, well, I want to go to that revival meeting. God's going to revive me. Well, did you pray up and ask him to show you all the things you need to give up before you went? Because a lot of times we take the same trash in and bring the same trash out and nothing changed. But we can stamp the book and say we went to a revival meeting. Philip talked a little bit about that when he was here, about what it means to have real revival. You know, I, I tell this story sometimes that one of the things that the the they call them the op four, the opposing force at JRTC. What they do is they'll hack into the computer systems of the unit that's coming through there, and they'll change all of their stuff so that whenever they get ready to call for fire with artillery, they're actually shooting at each other because they don't pay enough attention about what's going on to realize that everything changed within their own organization because they don't know it well enough to know when, it, when something's happened. And I shake my head sometimes and go, how dumb can you be? Well, that ain't any different than us. We get so focused on worldly things that we're not paying attention to spiritual things and Satan will turn all that stuff inward on you. And the next thing you know, we're shooting and sniping at each other in here over things that really, when, it, when you get down to it, they don't matter. None of it matters. And he does it every single day. And he's after, again, he's after our families. And he starts it with the TV. He starts it with YouTube videos. He starts on Facebook and every other social media. I can't tell you how many kids I've seen this week where mom and dad hand them a phone to babysit them and they have access to everything that they could possibly, some of them accidentally, but but all of those little clickbait things pop up, and next thing you know, they're looking at stuff they can't, they don't need to be looking at. Now, Satan doesn't take a break. He don't take off on the weekends. He don't work an eight-hour day. He's a 24-7 guy, and he's desperately and constantly doing things for us. And he knows that we think that his, or, or, or Satan knows that his time is limited, but sometimes we don't live like we know that. That we only have a finite amount of time. Christ is coming back. And when he does, that the, the curtain's going to fall. Satan knows that. And that's why he's so urgent in what he's doing. I, I firmly believe from a tactical standpoint that if I was plotting what he was doing from his perspective, he's going to try to take as many people to hell with him as he can. That's his way of winning. That sounds dumb. But that that's that I believe that's it. He has so much pride. That's what got him kicked out of heaven. I think that's his way of trying to get even with God. That's, a, again, a crazy idea, but that's what it seems like to me. The last thing I'll close with is this, that we've got to pray. Verse 38 says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Now, I don't mention this last because this is the least effective. This is probably the most important of all of the others. Because Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that after we put on our armor, then, then we stand firm and we pray in the spirit. So something about discipleship class that I mentioned earlier that I learned this week, how many times do you ask the Holy Spirit to teach you how to pray? 
I can tell you that I can count on one hand the number of times I've asked that. It's, and really, it started this past two weeks. When you ask the Holy Spirit to tell you how to teach you how to pray, He will instruct you on the things to pray for. And all of a sudden, you know, Aunt, uh, Grandma's uh, gallbladder and all those other things, while they're important, that's not really what we're called to pray for. We're called to pray for people that need Jesus. And then we're called to act. Faith without works is dead. And I'm not saying you're saved by works, but you're saved unto works. Which means, again, as a part of the body, you're called to serve. Many times we pray, Lord, I want revival, but don't start it in me. But as I, as I mentioned to you guys before, here, here's my, this is my confirmation so that you guys can hear it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Everybody, again, is called to be a preacher. But when was the last time you led somebody to Jesus? Because if you're not constantly out there, and I can tell you, just like fishing, right? We were referring it to fishing. If you're throwing that bait, sooner or later you're going to get a strike. How many times are you throwing your bait? How many times are you casting the seed? When's the last time you led somebody to Jesus? Guys, we got we got to be about the business. I, I used to think that's not my job. That's the preacher's job. That, that's a wrong attitude. I can tell you now, it, it's almost like a hot when you get to share Jesus with somebody. That little girl the other night at the at the D now. I don't know if you were down there, whatever, that little girl at the cross. But that, look, I would have stayed there till 2.30 in the morning to get to, to finish sharing with that little girl. And then to listen to her pray and ask God to just completely take control of her life, that was one of the most precious moments I've ever got to witness. And I'm not telling you that because it ain't about me. But when you open your spiritual eyes, God will show you those opportunities and you get to participate. You get to make a choice. I could have got the car, we could have left, we'd have been home by 10.30. But, like, nope, because I knew this was coming. And I didn't want to stand here and tell y'all, well, here was a thing that I passed up on. Somebody would have got that blessing. And I was just thank God that I got to, uh, to, to share with that. So here, here's what I'm going to close with this morning. Guys, time's running out. And there's a bunch of farmers in here. So, you know, we're, we, we've got to harvest the crops when they're ripe. you got a window of opportunity, right, when your crops come due that you can pull those or else something's going to, you're either going to lose them. <laughs> Most of the time, weather gets them. Uh, before you get them out, we get into the rainy season. But we have that narrow window because the harvest is ripe. Jeremiah eight twenty tells us the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. John 9, 4 says that we must work the works of him who sent us while it's day because night is coming when no one can work. There's going to come a point in time when God's going to close the, the door on this thing and we're not going to be able to reach those anymore, just like he did on the ark and some of the other examples. There was a lot of good people that were outside that ark, and I guarantee you Noah knew a bunch of them. Can you imagine the screams that are coming? To let me in, let me in. Well, what did you do with it when I was giving it to you? When I told you we were going to have this happen, what were you doing then? Why didn't you come in with us? Well, I, didn't, I was too busy, or I didn't believe, or, or whatever. Folks, there's going to be a lot of that. I don't want to hear that from anybody that, that I know. I want to try to, again, share with them. My brother's one of them. But the fact is, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's going to end up that way. Matthew 7 is pretty clear. Narrow is the gate. And few are going to find it. But we, again, should we should try to increase that number as much as we can. Amen. Here's a verse that struck me because when I was working in special operations, this was their verse. You believe that? Army units have Bible verses. And it's Isaiah 6, 8. It says, And I heard the voice saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And then I, I said, Here I am, send me. Folks, that ought to be all of us. Yeah. When God says, Who am I going to send to you know, downtown Winsboro to share with those folks down there or to Monroe or somewhere. Else. And look, and I know it's dangerous. Alexander is the most dangerous place in Louisiana right now. That's the people that need Jesus because they don't know any other way. They've been lied to and think that they've got to, 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 to fall to, to guns and, and violence and everything else. All you need to do what I'm talking about this morning is a ready and willing heart. And, and again, the mission is very simple. We don't need to make it any more difficult by being fearful or, in, or insecure. All we need to do is trust that God's going to do what he said he would do, and that's to lead us. The Holy Spirit will teach you all that you need to know. He will give you the words that you need to say. But here comes the question. Are you willing to accept that mission? A lot of people are not. So this morning as I close, then, hey, I would ask you to ask God to search your heart. Do you have an urgency for your neighbor? Do you have an urgency for your community? Do you have an urgency for your family? 
I got a brother right now that I talked to when I was standing on the tailgate of that trailer unloading for that last retreat. And he listed out every great thing he's done. And I said, you know, Thomas, I love you with all my heart. But here's the thing, brother, that if you do not surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter what I do for you. It doesn't matter how much I love you or anything else. That you fight going to hell. And I didn't say that ugly, and I don't mean it to beat him up. And I told him that I love him. But I can't help him accept truth. He has to be willing to accept that. And he said, you know, um, I, I, in fact, I, I just thought about this, Michelle. I shared with him last Palm Sunday the full gospel for three hours in St. Francis up there. He was sitting there with congestive heart failure, thought he was going to die. He was really willing to accept it then, but he never fully accepted what I was saying. I, I look, guys, I walked out there exhausted. I mean, I literally went through every verse I knew how to let him read it and share it with him, and he never, he, he never would give up. Here he is on his back again. And I said, have you noticed there's a trend here? This is the second time you call me, second time you want to talk about this, and you're sick again. And this is what he said. He goes, see, are you telling me that God allows me to get sick to get my attention? I said, now you're starting to hear what I'm putting down. What kind of God loves us enough to put us in a position to force us to have to make that critical decision. All the time wanting us to accept him. I mean, the Bible says he died once for all. Not for a few, this one or that one, for all. Yet there are still people like my brother that are not willing to surrender. How many folks are sitting in here this morning that have never surrendered? Because I'm going to tell you, again, I've said this from here before, the odds are there are some in here. In fact, there's a lot of statistical information that will say it's between 50 and 80 percent. Now, we draw straws. Or you can just allow the Holy Spirit to penetrate your heart this morning and show you. I can tell you this from personal experience. If you ask God to show you if you're lost, he will. But then you're going to make a choice. Either you're going to accept him or reject him. Chances are some of you in here have already done that before. How many times do you think God's going to call you? There's a point in time, I don't know what that is, I think it's different for everybody, where he stops calling. He gives you over to a reprobate mind. Go study that word for a while. The Greek has a lot, and the Hebrew has a lot to say about that word. And it ain't pleasant. Guys, I don't have all the answers to everything, but I tell you who does. And he reveals those to us as we're able and willing to accept them. And then he teaches us how to take those and, and fully implement them into what he would have us to do. The Christian walk is hard. It is. It's easy to get frustrated with people. It's easy to get frustrated with things in a life. But this is all temporary. This is going to be gone very soon. What we're going to deal with in eternity is forever. And that's the thing that I've heard my pastor say for 20 years. Eternity is too wrong to be long. Or too long to be wrong. And yet people are accepting it. I'll just do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. So what I ask you this morning is we, you guys can, can start that the... the uh, Hey, the altar's open up here. You got something you want to lay down, a burden you want to lay down, I'll pray with you. Uh, Jamie will pray with you. We can get some of the guys to come up here and pray with you.